to. We should have uh, plenty to go around. And uh, listen, we are really excited about this time of the year uh, because this is an opportunity for us to see what God is doing with us as a ministry on a global sense. And that's amazing because we are a community of faith that's way beyond just Evansville, Indiana. We are actually ministering in other parts of the world in this very same moment in time. And that's amazing. I don't know how that, that excites me to know that I'm a part of something that's way bigger than my little sphere of contact and connection and my little way of life. Because, you know, I may have an opportunity to touch people's lives and talk to people, but I also have an opportunity to be a part of something that's global and something that's making a difference around the world. And I'm really excited about that. And uh, today, one of the things we're going to do is we're going to have an opportunity uh, to get to uh, go to Togo, Africa, and to visit with a missionary couple that's more than just a missionary couple in Togo, Africa. For those of you that do not know Andy and Amanda Justison, I want to make certain that I introduce them to you. Andy and Amanda, they are a, a couple who came from Anderson, Indiana, and uh, they had come here. Andy got a job in Evansville. Amanda went to school uh, for nursing at USI, and uh, and in that they began to uh, develop a relationship with one another which they had already had in Anderson. They had liked each other there. They came here, but then uh, they, as a couple, decided they needed to find a good church. Uh, and I can't remember. I know each of them had their own apartment and everything, and, and they, were doing, uh, they were doing life, but apart from a community of faith. And so they began to look around Evansville for God to give them a place to worship and a place to connect. Well, Mill Road Baptist Church became their church. When they first walked in the door, they said they knew this was the place they were supposed to be. And so they connected with us, and it was shortly thereafter uh, they ended up getting married and making a commitment to one another. Amanda, her dad, is a pastor in Anderson, Indiana, and uh, so her dad performed the wedding there in Anderson. Betty and I had the privilege of going and being a part uh, of uh, being there to observe them uh, getting married. It was a special wedding. It was a little unique. Uh, uh, it was outside, and all the ladies, uh, though they were in their formal dresses and all, were barefooted and walking. Uh, and I could understand why. I mean, the ground was kind of like it wasn't the most level uh, of area, so I'm sure being in some kind of hills or something would have been horrid. Uh, but it was a unique wedding, but a very uh, God-honoring wedding. And man, what a privilege it's been for us to get to know Andy and Amanda. Uh, Andy, he worked at Channel 14 as a cameraman. And his specialty is in multimedia and television and broadcasting and that kind of thing. And he loves to do that. And so he helped when he got here at the church. He helped us to begin to uh, tweak our website and to get things set up and get those things right and then at the time we had a youth pastor his name was Andy Martin Pastor Andy Martin and Andy we used to do videos and all kinds of things and create promotionals and that's Pastor Andy and Andy Justison would do take his skill sets and he would video those things for us and then edit them and uh, we, we put together some really awesome things together at the same time, Amanda, she got involved in ministry at Mill Road and began to teach. And so she taught some classes uh, for Sunday school and then for Awana. She was a Awana uh, leader there. And then actually Andy and Amanda took over and was commander of Awana at one time uh, for a period of time. Now they were actively involved teachers. And what I mean by that, it was more than just teaching a class on a given Sunday morning but they would have sleepovers and have their kids come and stay at their house and they would go do some discovery stuff out in like behind the church here where the wooded area is, which really is just our yard, but it has trees. And they would do some discovery things with the little kids and they would have uh, events for them. And they really truly invested when they ministered here at Mill Road. And then God laid on their heart that he wanted to do more with them. 
And so Andy, out of curiosity, began to get on the internet and started searching out what the options were, what the capabilities were of possibly going on the mission field and seeing what was available. And they went to the site of ABWE, and at the site of ABWE, which is a mission board, they found this ministry that was, uh, was launching in Togo, Africa, and listened to the things that were being the elements they were taking in as ministry in this country. They were wanting to start a hospital and a radio station. Now keep in mind, Andy in broadcasting and multimedia and Amanda in nursing. And it was like an immediate connection to know that that's what God wanted them to get involved with and be a part of. And there was already a team of missionaries that had started this, the one uh, who was the uh, designer of this whole uh, uh, mission endeavor, had already put together the plans for the hospital and everything, and then they were creating this whole concept of the radio station, and there was this immediate satisfaction of connection that Andy and Amanda had with this mission. They began deputation, going around, traveling around churches, asking churches to get behind their vision and to be a part. Of course, before they did that, they had to go through schooling and training. And they went through their schooling and training and they were prepared for the mission. Then they went out to churches and to individuals and asked for people to be a part in helping to prayerfully and financially support them on this in this endeavor to be missionaries in Togo, Africa. Now let me tell you just a little bit about Togo, Africa. It is in West Africa and it is in a war-torn country. They are located between two fractions that fight against each other all the time and they hate each other. And because of that, they felt the need of a hospital that could minister to both fractions. The only real challenge to that is is when you have people from each side coming to the hospital. That can create tensions in and of itself, but they're there to help. And then by creating this radio station uh, in this Muslim world, they're able to, to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ out in that area by airwaves. Now you may say, who in the world in West Africa is going to have a radio? Listen to me. In third world countries, they may not have anything, but they got a radio. I'm just telling you, because it's their connection with the world. And so the possibilities were amazing. Well, Andy and Amanda, they got their money raised, their support. And again, I just skipped over a lot of processes, like two years of getting their money, traveling around to churches, the discouragement, thinking maybe they weren't going to get there. And then God finally took them over, the, over what they needed to get their money to be able to go. And so they left to go to Africa. They have been there now since January. So here we are now in the 10th month. They've been there for a complete nine months. Now they're into their 10th month. In the process, I believe they've had at least two, if not three of their missionaries that have passed away. The founder of the whole concept of this, of creating the hospital law, the visionary to this, was the first person to pass away. That was a blow to the group. Then they had someone else that had passed away. And they've had certain situations that have been heavy against them. And for those that don't know, Andy got malaria. His kids have had malaria, but he got malaria. And he also got, uh, somebody help me out because my mind's not going to think of it. Syphilitis. Syphilitis, right? I think that's right. Syphilitis. And with those two diseases that he received, that he got, he dealt with that for several weeks where he couldn't see, he couldn't think clear. His wife had to do everything for him, and she was really worried for him because uh, it, it, was, it mimicked. We have a couple people in our church that have MS, and it mimicked the signs of MS. Even though they went through all the testing and they said, we don't know what's wrong with you, they thought that maybe he had MS. And so he came back to the United States, and they 
admitted him in the hospital, and that's when they had realized that he had syphilitis. And apparently at the time when he was in the country, he didn't have malaria because they pick up a malaria. I mean, they can detect that quick. And they have medicines in their country to care for malaria because it's so prevalent in that country. So somewhere after his testing in Togo, Africa, he ended up with malaria on top of the syphilitis. So when he came back to the United States and they diagnosed his case, the problem is in the United States, we are not equipped for malaria. We don't have the medicines available, readily available for malaria. And so they were like, what are we going to do? We don't know what to do. And God laid out every step. It was absolutely amazing what God did for them. Because they got on the phone, they began to call around, and they ended up finding, now get this, they found a missionary who had an extra supply of medicine for malaria where he had gotten malaria, and he just happened to have some left over, and he was in the United States. And he was in... Uh, he was within a hundred miles of where they were. And so they got in the car and drove and got the medicine they needed. Isn't that amazing? Not only that, there is a doctor in Anderson, Indiana, who once they started researching, found out that he, is, he was a Christian. He had been on a lot of mission trips, and he has had malaria, I believe, 15 times. And he was a doctor who could care for his need, and he lived in Anderson, Indiana. How many times would you ever first know anybody who's dealt with malaria that many times, but then to also be a doctor and also live in the same hometown that you were residing in at the moment? God did some remarkable things, and I want to tell you how that happened. It was through the faithfulness and consistency of God's people praying for Him. See, as a church, Andy and Amanda are a part of this family. They have been here at this church for approximately 15 years. Longer than most of you have been here. Probably longer than double that what some of you have been here. They are a part of our, our family, our community of faith. And when God put it on their heart to go, it wasn't easy for us to let go of such a good couple because they were so involved and they were so active and they were so faithful to this work and ministry. But we knew it was God's call on their life. And so we said, if that's what God's calling you to do, then as a church, as a church family, we support you 100% with our prayers and with our energies and with whatever God will allow us to do to help you go. And so they are nothing less than an arm and an extension of our family all the way around in Togo, Africa. Now, you ready to go visit them? I can see you now. Hey, I can see you too. <laughs> Good. First, uh, just to let Sung Larry by know, in our first group, we didn't have visual. He wasn't able to see us, uh, but we could see him. Now, now we're able to be here together. And, uh, hi, Nora. Hello. All right. Andy, you got your whole family there, don't you? Yeah, they're, we're just running around here. Hey, Silas. Yeah, we are. We're getting ready to uh, go home and fix supper because we have um, our service tonight at the at the guest house. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I am too. I am too. Thank you for praying. It was a little little trip there, um, July, August, September, kind of a whirlwind, but um, we're glad to be back together as a family. Mm-hmm. 
Um, it, it, ha it happened, the first thing happened in July, like the first week or so of July. Um, so since then I hadn't been uh, thinking straight or I couldn't see real well and um, lots of weird, weird issues. And so um, up until about September 1st, um, I went to the States. Just a minute, let me get made right here. Um, and uh, so, yes, yeah, about two months, um, I was not, not myself. Um, here's Amanda. What? There's a, there's a storm coming. Takes about 10 minutes to drive. Oh. Oh, we're at the post office. Here. Oh. Well, to check our mail to see if you guys sent us anything, but you didn't, so. No. <laughs> no, um, it's the only, it's, it's right underneath the uh, the cell phone tower, and we the only our only internet is is 3G, um, so this is the strongest place in town we can get internet. So it's really really weak at our house and inconsistent. So we just came out here, and especially for video calls, it's it's hard to do at home. Maybe. Maybe. You can turn it off if you want. You can turn it off if you want to turn the picture off on your end. Yeah, we know what you look like. I don't know. I don't either. Hey, Luke. <laughs> your house you don't have 3g well you can get it if you're in a certain room or something like that um and, and if it's, you hold it's kind your of mouth spotty. right well you gotta usually we put a we put the phone in a pringles can and point it toward the tower <laughs> and sometimes it works like that <laughs> okay yeah i i we understand how that is uh the other day i was watching barry talk on the cell phone and he was standing on a picnic table trying to get a better reception so we understand how that works um well hey just uh just real briefly i would like for you if you would to share with us what is your basic understanding for your family um when it comes to missions what does that look like for you and your family all right you're serving there in togo africa but give us a give us a, a view of what that looks like for you guys there um, missions is missions is like it is in the states. You live, and as you live, um, you are reaching out to people. And so we are living here, and so we're reaching out to the people around us. Um, everyone that you talk to, everyone that you go and see at the market, or you go and pay your bill, or you go and see your friends, um, you introduce them to Christ, and you show them the truth. And um, so it's it's no different than what you should be doing anywhere else in the world. Um, we just happen to be living here. And so missions is um, seeing people and building relationships and um, showing Christ through our lives. And then also along with that, you are a part of a ministry with a hospital, right? And with a radio right. station. 
And We're a big team. Yeah, how, how big is the team there? Oh, we have, what, 50 or 60 people? No? No, that's way too many. Oh, we have a lot of short-termers that come and go, so like it's hard to... nurses that come back and forth and doctors that come in. But a team, like families and kids that are here, like, all the time, there's a total of about 30 of us. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> that are staying and that don't stay leave. here and don't leave. Yeah. Right, right. And of course, you've had you've had some uh, unfortunate deaths within your team, and right. all that, and uh, had some real challenges since you've been there in the last nine months, right? Yeah, our team's kind of hit hard this last year. Um, the hospital opened about a year and a half ago, and right at, about a year after that. Um, uh, our, our head surgeon, he passed away, um, the very thing he loved to be doing. And, and then we had a, a pharmacist who died too. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been a little difficult um, emotionally and, and spiritually too um, for our team here. But um, we've, uh, we've, we've been doing well um, as far as trying to get ministry moving and, and um, seeing things, we're seeing people come to, to know the truth and, um, and salvations and, and people interested in just learning more about the Bible and um, wanting to start Bible studies and things like that. So um, in fact, um, Amanda is, is starting one this week um, with, a, with a lady here in town. Um, so you can be praying for that. And um, yeah, so it's, we're, now, we're, we're trying to ministry as, as uh, life happens here. Yeah, now what is the, uh, what is the religion of total Africa? Um, well, there's, it, in, Togo, in this area in Togo, it's, it's Islam, mainly. Um, other areas in Togo, it's um, like a animistic um, spirit worship and things like that, like a traditional African uh, voodoo, things like that, but um, but in this area, it's predominantly Islam. Okay, and then now you're kind of lodged between two fractions of people in the war-torn country, is that right? Yeah, we, I mean, we're kind of a, a mix, I guess, where we are. Um, more Islam than, than animism, but um, but they're kind of merged, and, and so they call it, they, they try to mix the two, and... Um, whatever they can do to try to find some kind of foundation um and so we call that like a, a folk religion um but yeah it's it's kind of a, a mixture of whatever they can put together and and try to make up themselves right now the you said the hospital was up and running for about the last year and a half now right Yes. Okay, and then now the radio station, uh, what, what's the progress of the radio station? Can you hear it? Sorry, it's hard to hear. You had a, had a motorcycle pass through here. Oh, no problem. What, what's it's the something, progress? Something about the radio station? Yeah, the progress on the radio station. They have the tower up, is that right? The tower is up, um, and we have two buildings under construction. Uh, transmitter and um, the latest one um, and we got most of the building constructed but we're just waiting to put in um, like the the finishing touches like the equipment and, and actually constructing each individual room and making offices and things like that. I get you. Okay. And, um, so now will you guys be in there when it comes to how you're supported, you don't have a job there in the country as far as a, a national, like, you know, you, you didn't go and fill out an application in Togo, Africa, and go down to work, work at the local market or anything, is that right? Yeah, I'll let you hear the Okay, I can't, I think that you stopped talking. Here, just, that storm is coming, and people are getting ready to, like, get into their house and everything. Oh, so there's motorcycles passing. There's motorcycles passing all by, but you're right. Like we can't work a job. It's actually illegal for us to be working, um, make money here um, in Togo because we're not Togolese. Um, so actually it's kind of hard sometimes because um, it's probably a pride issue, but we've always been kind of self-sufficient. You are living in the United States. We have broadcasting degrees, have a nursing degree. You get a job, you work your job. 
you make your money and you don't depend on anybody else. You just, you know, you do your job and you get your money um, from your employer just like you should. And if you change jobs, there you go. Out here, it's totally different. We are totally dependent on the people who say that they're going to support us and support the work out here and the mission work out here because we can't do anything else. We can't even go get a job even though we have skills. Even if I go work at the hospital, they can't compensate me for any of the, the time I put in. So um, it's totally a lot of trust in God and faith and partnerships with people because if people don't support us, if people don't send in the money, then we have no income and we're just here with nothing. So it's a lot of trust and it's a lot of gratitude and it's a lot of humility um, and thankfulness to the people and the churches that are supporting us while we're out here because we actually can't do it ourselves. We have no ability to. So it's very... Um, it's a twist of events, and it's a great faith stretcher for us, for sure. Nice. Well, you know, so the uh, so what support you get from Mill Road, prayerfully and financially, are crucial to your existence there in Tokyo. Do you know what? I don't know. I'm sorry. Can you, can you say that again? Yeah, I said so. Your our support, prayerfully and financially. Uh, is vital to your existence there in Togo, yeah. is that right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. A little bit. <laughs> All right. But guys, we love you. We appreciate you. And uh, everybody sends their love. And uh, you take care of those little kiddos for us. Okay. okay. We love you guys. Thanks. All right. Say bye. You. Hey, show us, show us if you could the area you're standing there. Can you show us uh, okay. sure. around you just real quick? Yeah. We'll just walk this way. There's, I don't know, can you see the little boutique with the green umbrella? Um, yes, under the trees? Yeah, that's uh -huh. where we go. You have to go there to get internet. Um, you pay them for credit, and they also are how we get our phone service. So you go there. Is that a um, goat? Uh, yes, that's a goat. Okay, that's what I thought. <laughs> There's, there's more that you probably can't see. That's towards market area right there. Okay. That's um, the clouds. Here's some kids. This is kind of the center of town. Uh-huh. Wow. So, and here's the post office. I think you can see where we were just at. There's our tower. And the tower. That's why we can talk to you. <laughs> nice. Awesome. Well, guys, we love you, and we want you to get into your home and, and be safe. And uh, we'll continue to be praying for you. And we have your 30-day of prayer uh, uh, pamphlet that you gave us that we've given out to everybody. Excellent. Thank you, guys. All right. God bless you. We'll see you later. Okay. Love right. you guys. Bye. Bye. Love you guys. Bye-bye. Right. Isn't that awesome? Amazing. I tell you what, we live in a day today that we can do that. That just is crazy. That we can be there live talking to them. It's not by video. It's for real. Uh, I'm going to put this other mic down. Um, I'll put it back up here so they'll have it. All right. If you would, take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Matthew. And we're going to spend just the next few minutes in this passage here in Matthew and chapter 28. And if you've been a church-going person at all, you probably have heard this passage throughout your lifetime. And uh, it's a powerful passage that we have in the scriptures. And I just want to set the stage for you if I, if I can. Have you ever had a time when somebody was going to be leaving or maybe you were going to be leaving to go somewhere, whether it be on a trip or whether it be you were moving away? Probably every one of us in here have moved away from one area that we lived in. Uh, to move to somewhere else. I know this is a very transit area, Evansville is, and, and there's a lot of people who actually 
were not born in Evansville, but they have, they have found their way here, and this is now life for them. How many of you, you were not, you were not born in Evansville? Let me see your hands. See, now look around, look around, see what I'm talking about? More than half of those that are in the auditorium right now um, are not from Evansville. And so you, you can relate with what I'm about ready to say to you. If you have been raised in Evansville and you have children, you can relate to this in the regard that your kids have gone through this, maybe to go off to college or to do something, uh, or you've had a friend or a relative who has lived here in Evansville with you, but they left. And here's what I'm saying. When that happened, you realize your connection with whoever it is that you're connected to is about to change. For me, it was with my dad a few months ago. I'd come to a place where I realized our connection was going to be broke and we would never have communication with each other again until... I breathe my last breath or Jesus comes back and takes me to heaven, then I'll get to wrap my arms around his neck again. But we knew the inevitable was happening. And whether it's you're moving away or somebody else is moving away, or maybe it's someone who's, who's passing away, you know those last few opportunities for connection are extremely important, aren't they? Matter of fact, you'll probably have conversations with that person that maybe you have failed to have up to this very point in time. Now, I remember those conversations with my dad. They were connections like ones we had never had prior to because we knew this was it. And it's tough and it's hard to have to say goodbye. But what I want you to get is the atmosphere and the spirit of what's going on in the passage that I'm about to read with you. Is that Jesus had spent 33 and a half years on this earth. He spent three and a half years with the disciples in ministry serving along. They served alongside of him. They did life together every day. And now he comes to this place where he's about ready to ascend into heaven and to set by the right hand of the Father. And he's about to leave the disciples. And this serious conversation is going to take place. As we find in Matthew chapter 28 and verse number 16, it says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when, he saw, and when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Here's what I want you to get and what I want you to understand. Have you ever worked a job where you had a certain skill set? I mean, you worked that position for a really long time, and it was time for you to have to relinquish your responsibility to someone else? You know how hard that is, right? You understand how difficult that is? When you know that you have worked for so long, you've got experience put together in this area, you've got the, harder road, uh, the road of hard knocks that you've gone down, you've figured out certain things, you know how it needs to be done, and, you, and, and it's like a well-oiled machine. You understand how to accomplish. Now, some of you may not know what it's like to hand over a position like that, but... Probably those of you that have kids that have moved out of the house, you understand what I'm saying. Because you give these life skills to your kids. And yet, no matter how many life skills you give to them, you know that you'll always be ahead of them in your ability to make more rational decisions that are going to be beneficial than what they will at a young age because they don't have the experience of decision-making. Now, they may trip over doing it well and may be better than you on occasion, but it will not be because they have the same skill set that you have since you have lived so much life and have gone down these roads already. And so for some of you, you know what it's like to have your teens to leave the house, young adult, 
and you're giving them instruction, be careful. Just because it's shiny and glitters and looks good doesn't mean you ought to sink all your money into it, right? Because not everything that shines is worth having. And you give them instruction and directions on things to watch out for. And, and, and you try to lay that out for them. But you know in the process they're probably not going to get it exactly right. That's the hard part about letting go, isn't it? Listen to me for a moment. Here Jesus is with his 11 disciples and he's saying some very important things to them and and understand that Jesus had all authority that was in heaven and that was on earth. He could call down more than 10,000 angels. There's an area in scripture where, or actually, yeah, he could call down, he could call down, I think it was... 10,000, or no, 10, yeah, 10,000 legions of angels. 10,000 legion, not just 10,000 angels, 10,000 legion of angels. A legion is approximately 6,000. So you do the math, 6,000 it was actually, it's a little over 6,000. It's 6,000, 7,000. And they say that a legion of angels would have been approximately 72,000 angels he could have called down. I don't know about you, but that's, that's some pretty big resources. Because let me tell you what one angel did. One angel fought a battle and he won over, he, he, he won a battle that was over a thousand people large, the army that he fought. One angel. So do the math. If you had one angel that could do that, what could 72,000 angels do? Go into battle. You see what I'm saying? He had all authority in heaven and on earth. He had it. Now, here's the thing. That would be like you having that position or that job or, or as a parent, you having all the finances you need, you have uh, all the resources you need to making decisions and you have all those things and now you're about ready to launch your kid out to go live life and they got to go get a, a, you know, a minimum wage job and they don't have much resources and you're going, hey, let me, let me help you out here and they're, oh, no, no, I can do it myself and, you know, and they want to go out and you're thinking, oh, my goodness. <laughs> I'm sending them out to the wolves. I can do this better than they can. I've got experience to how to make good choices more than they have. Listen to what I'm getting at here. Do you think anybody could do ministry better than Jesus could do it? He did it right. He never messed it up. He always made the right decisions on everything that he did. But yet, here he comes to this point in time where he's going to relinquish the responsibility of ministry to you and to me. I'm not Jesus. I I personally can't call down ten legion of angels. I I can't. I, I don't have that power. And yet, Jesus is relinquishing responsibility to us for ministry. Now here's what I don't want you to miss. Cuz this is powerful. You ready? Look at it. It goes on to say in this passage, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. In verse 19 says, "Go therefore and make disciples of all nations." Now you go, "Wait a minute. Hold on. Stop. Back up the train for a minute." He just got done saying that He had all power and authority in heaven and on earth to accomplish what needed to be done. And now he's saying, I have it, but you go. How is that supposed to be comforting to me to know that he's better at this than I am, and yet he's telling me to go? Why is that? Here's where these two thoughts marry. If you miss anything I say in this message today, don't miss this. Jesus is simply saying that he has all authority in heaven and on earth. And he says, because he has all authority, he wants us to go. Ladies, it'd be like you getting in the kitchen with your mom, if she's like a really great cook, or your grandma. And and boy, she's got some wonderful food that she makes. And all of a sudden, she looks at you and goes, hey, I want you to make this item. And you're going, 
uh, that's like your specialty. <laughs> Why do you want me to make that? You're good at that. Why would you ask? I'm not qualified to make that. Now listen to what Jesus is saying. And again, hear what I'm saying is this being your mother or your grandmother saying it to you. This is what Jesus is saying. No worries. I'm in the kitchen and I know how to do it and I'm going to help you step by step by step to do it right. Because I have all authority in heaven and in earth for you to accomplish what I need done. And because I have the ability, therefore, because I have the ability, you go. And I got your back. That's what Jesus is saying. And so he's saying here, you go. Now, this word go, geo, a very small word, but I'm going to give it to you in a way that I hope you never forget it. Because the first letter to go is G. And the G, in, as I see it, the letter G stands for God. God. So, the only way I can go is to understand that God's got my back. That God's going to care for my needs. That God has all authority in heaven and earth for me to be able to go. God, I have to remember that. I can't lose sight of that. That's extremely important. But then the O, the O is others. I can't lose sight of what my mission is. My mission is others. See, Jesus said... All the law and prophets are wrapped up in these two things. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, and all your strength. And the second is likened to it, to love your neighbor, to love others as yourself. So therefore, go. Love God. Let the love of God be the power in your life to understand you're not going alone. He loves you and he cares for you and he wants to use you. And he has given you the call to go and to share the good news of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. And you're not left to yourself. He's standing there. He's got your back. He's going to give you the ability to speak. He's going to give you the ability to accomplish. He's going to provide your needs. So once you get that solidified in your life, and that is the foundation, you understand that? Then you can focus on others, and you can go, and you can make a difference in a lost and dying world. What are we supposed to go do? It says, go therefore and make what? What does it say? To make disciples. Now I want to ask you this question. What is a disciple? When you think of a disciple, what is a disciple? Somebody just said it, I think. Say it again. A follower of Jesus, right? That's what a disciple is. He had his 11 disciples there with him, and they were his disciples because they, they forsook everything to follow Jesus. It wasn't about doing what they wanted to do. It was about doing what Jesus wanted them to do. And Jesus is telling you and I to go into this lost world and help them understand they are to love God with all their heart and to love others and then to, as well, in their life, when they get those things and they understand they embrace them, then they are to go and they are to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. As very often is said, uh, it is the gospel that we're to go and give people. You know, our world's about taking pills, right? Well, let's give them the gospel, okay? Because they need that. That's what's going to change people. And so we are to go and share the good news of Jesus Christ. And so we go and we share in order that we can see that we're calling others to be followers of Jesus and to be his disciples. We're to make disciples of all nations. In other words, of all people groups. Not just Americans, but all people groups. Our responsibility is to get the good news of Jesus Christ around the world in all the different countries possible that we can. And he says, Bab uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit. By the way, can I let you in on a secret? This is not talking about water baptism here. 
Okay, I know this verse has been used a lot for water baptism. I mean, water baptism is important. We need water baptism. But this is talking about something different from water baptism. Matter of fact, in the Scripture, the Bible says unless we uh, are born of water and of spirit, that we're not saved. And let me help you understand what born of water means. I talked about it last week. When I talked about a lady being pregnant, and you know that the baby's coming when her what breaks? When her water breaks. Did you know that every one of us were baptized into life? Did you know that? You wouldn't be here today if you weren't baptized into life. You were baptized in the water of your mother's womb. Then the water broke and you said, <laughs> as you came out of that water, and life happened. Never thought about it, have you? It's a pretty amazing thought. And then, not only are we to be born of water, and that's, again, not what this is talking about here. That is not talking about physical birth, but, but another passage of Scripture talks about we have to be born of water and of spirit. Now we're going to talk about the baptism it's talking about right here. He's talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit comes in, in light of our salvation. When we give our life to Jesus and we surrender to Him to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus, then we are baptized with the Holy Spirit of God. Now listen to me, there's other denominations and religions who say that salvation and baptism of the Holy Spirit are two different things and that you have to speak in tongues to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Here, my friend, I'm telling you, the Word of God does not say that at all. When you receive Jesus Christ as Savior of your life, you are, you are baptized into the Spirit of God. And apart from the Spirit of God, you are not one of God's. But there's only one way you can get to heaven, and that's through salvation in Jesus Christ, which immediately, along with you calling out on Jesus, you are baptized in the Spirit of God. And then, in order that we can symbolically represent what God has done for us in our baptism of the Holy Spirit, we're baptized in a baptism. And we're taken down in the water and brought back up out of the water. And it is only symbolic that we have now been baptized twice. Once we were baptized when we were, say, or when we were born, unless you're born of water, unless you're born of water and born of the Spirit, you don't know Jesus. You're not a Christian. In other words, you have to be physically born, that's your first baptism, and you have to be spiritually born, which is being baptized in the Holy Spirit. When Jesus, uh, when He then imparts to us the Holy Spirit of God in our life, and that comes through salvation. So what are we supposed to do? To go into the world and to share the good news and to create disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, and here it is, listen to it. Remember the one who said, I have all power that is in heaven and in earth. Therefore, go listen to what he says in the last part of this verse. He simply says, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the ages. In other words, I got your back. You're not called to go alone. You're called to serve and to minister 